علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى يوم الدين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال الله الحكيم في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ذلك ومن يعدم شعائر الله فإنها من تقوى القلوب صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yesterday we began this conversation reflecting on what is that enduring aspect? Why is it that the ziyara of Imam Hussein has endured throughout time and space? What is it that makes these rituals, these pilgrimages that we make towards Allah? last throughout time and what is it that makes them universal said that there are a number of dimensions that the ahlul bayt point us to they uncover the reality of these events these pilgrimages what allah calls the sha'air of himself sha'airullah and sha'air again on one level it means a signpost or a marker when a person or a group, a caravan journeys, they are going from one city to another, they will usually have some sort of marker or some sort of flag, something that will indicate their presence. And these sha'air as well are those markers. Sha'air of Allah are those signposts, those markers of Allah, things that identify a person or an action with Allah Himself. So Allah identifies these actions with Himself, these rituals, and in particular the pilgrimage towards Hajj. We said that on one level, if you think about it, if you read history, you'll see that the Hajj pilgrimage began with the actions of a mother, the loving and caring mother towards her son. These are the, the event of Lady Hajar and her daughter, her son Ismail. It's back and forth between these two mountains. And as well the actions of Nabi Ibrahim, where he circumambulates, he surrounds and goes around the Kaaba. And as well the throwing of the rocks towards Shaitan and the slaughtering of that ram. All of these actions seem very sort of almost uh, normal and regular things. They don't seem particularly sacred. They just seem like profane actions. A mother cares for her child, and so she exerts herself to try to care for that child. A father will give, be given a message by Allah, and that message in our eyes might seem even ludicrous. It might seem very strange. If any one of us were to be told that Allah, by another one of our uh, fellow uh, community members, this person came and told us that Allah has given me a dream and he has told me to go and sacrifice my son. Not only would we find this strange, but we might even consider this person to have lost their mind, to have gone insane. But when it comes to the actions of particular people that Allah has designated, He has separated, He has seen their actions and their hearts to be in utter submission towards Himself. Allah separates these persons' actions not only as a particular sign, but He says that these actions have a higher reality. And if only we were attuned to that higher reality, then we could see the significance of these actions. And so Allah sets these people as symbols for all of humankind to follow. 
and he establishes the actions of these people as the rituals, as the signs and the symbols for his religion. And so that's where we get the Hajj from. So we want to figure out and understand what is it that makes these rituals not just last and become universal, but as well bring us closer to Allah, so close that they become symbols of Islam. They become symbols of the school of the Ahlul Bayt. Because in the end of the day, we do things, we praise people, we honor individuals in our society, or we see this happening in other societies, and yet we see that these actions don't last. They are confined to a particular society, to a particular people, or maybe even to a particular time. And Allah points us to this reality of His creation as well. That there, we might think that my life means something beyond the 50 or 60 years that I spend in it. And that's why I might dedicate my life towards doing this one thing. Right? We dedicate our lives towards, for example, acquiring wealth, towards living a comfortable life, maybe even creating a comfortable life for our kids. But then as time goes on, we realize that these pursuits are all limited. What is it that makes our lives worth living, that gives meaning to our lives? If we think about the sha'a'ir of Allah in these terms, then it becomes an important question for each and every one of us. How can we become enduring as well? How can we give meaning to our actions and to our lives at large? The wealth that we acquire, Allah says that this wealth, you cannot bring it with you into the grave. And we see this, whether Allah tells us or not. We experience this. We know at the same time that our children, they're going to grow and they're going to lead their own lives. And so if we think we dedicate our lives to our children, then those children as well, they are going to leave us one day. So we have to think about what is it that gives my life meaning beyond just these 60 or 70 years that I live. Beyond just that ni'mah, those that blessing that Allah has given me in this limited life. What is it that will make my life endure throughout time? And that's not something that comes from me. We see that in the sha'a'ir of Allah, Allah constantly is pointing towards certain principles. Principles that are universal. Principles that last throughout time. And he says the opposite if you don't adhere to these principles, then your life, the civilization that you create, maybe I think my life is limited, but then sometimes we create these civilizations, these societies around us that last longer than an individual's life. But Allah says that even these civilizations that you create, these societies that you build, even these will come to an end. So much so that for those who forsake Allah and forsake His commandments, they will be so fleeting, their societies, the effects of their societies will be so fleeting that you will go and traverse the lands and you will see the effects of these civilizations from many years ago. But then, you will see that these civilizations as well were destroyed. So much so that you don't even hear a whisper from these people. And so in Surat Maryam, just want to recite this ayah of Surat Maryam, ayah number 98, where Allah gives us and shows us an image of what He is talking about. He says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَكَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا قَبْلَهُمْ مِنْ قَرْنٍ هَلْ تُحِسُّ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ أَوْ تَسْمَعُ لَهُمْ رِكْزَ How many of a people did we destroy, obliterate? Do you even hear from them? Even a single person, has, they, have that, has that person endured after that 
town was destroyed? Or do you even hear a whisper, the slightest and the faintest thing that you can think about? Do you even hear that slightest whisper from these people? What are the traces of the Roman civilization that we have? Maybe we go and visit some of those old Roman towns. But we see that the greatest colosseums, the greatest monuments to those civilizations are destroyed. We have to uncover the earth. We have to es excavate the earth to be able to see the traces of these people. Think about the greatest ro the civilizations that human beings have ever created throughout history. Think about the Romans, the Greeks, and even civilizations that continue and endure to this day. The great British Empire. Once upon a time, the British Empire was so great that they used to say that the sun never sets upon the British Empire. They used to control so much land throughout the world that at every point in time there was always a place on the earth that the British controlled. And so now we see that the British don't have that same amount of power. All of these different sources of power at some point are strong, but then they become weak. And so we see that these same rituals, we have the mourning ceremony of the British Queen. And we think about all of these people come out and they pay their tributes towards this queen. But then, ultimately, it is limited. It is limited to those people who maybe find some sort of respect for the queen in their life. Maybe they have some sort of memory of this person. Or maybe even they are part of a society or a culture that honors this particular position. But it is still limited. In the end of the day, it is still limited. A hundred years from now, how many people will remember that there was a queen once upon a day? How many people will remember that I, for example, are one of those people who are in that procession, that I as well stood in that procession? What is it that makes that action endure and last? Allah tells us, through the words of the Ahlul Bayt, we know that one of the basic elements that gives meaning to our life is that is when your action corresponds to your nature as a human being. We said that according to the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt, we must mourn and shed tears. Our hearts must move when we think about Imam Hussein. Because we see and we understand as human beings the sacrifice that Imam Hussein had to give. And so we raise our children with these memories. The memories of a father sacrificing his sons, of a mother giving her sons, Lady Zainab, giving her sons in the path of Imam Hussein, and all of the different shuhada on that day. We understand it on a very basic human level, on a very basic emotional level. And so we are able to, our hearts are drawn towards Imam Hussein, whether we are Muslim or not. Once we hear the words of Imam Hussein and the story of Imam Hussein, our hearts are automatically attracted. But then the Ahlul Bayt say that this is not sufficient. Beyond that, you have to also have an understanding of the maqam and the ma'rifah of Imam Hussein. What was it that Imam Hussein was calling for? What was it that he was striving for? Why did he sacrifice himself and his family and his companions on that day? Not just that, but we have to also understand the level in which Imam Hussein was functioning, the position that he held as that direct connection with Allah Himself. And so we re recite in Ziyarat al Arba'in that the Imam was that source of hidayah for the Muslims. 
is that direct connection between human beings and Allah. And so on one level, we have an emotional connection. On another level, we have an intellectual connection with the journey of Abba Abdullah. That, that's what makes something endure. But that's not the only thing. On one level, we say that our actions and this ritual of Muharram corresponds to our very nature as human beings. We have an emotional attachment. We have an intellectual attachment. And just as a brief side note, sometimes we take this intellectual attachment too seriously. And so a lot of times we spend our, and in particular in, partic in our society, we spend a lot of time thinking about the history of this journey. And I'll mention this very briefly, but a lot of times we have this question. We hear particular stories about Imam Hussein. And, you know, in, my, in a particular culture, for example, in a South Asian culture, you have certain stories that you grow up with. Or in Iranian majalis, they recite particular stories. And then over time, in this culture in particular, we see that there's this rise in the importance of history. History becomes a very important aspect, gives an important dimension to our understanding of Karbala. And so we say that what history tells us is different from those stories that we have heard. I grew up with certain stories about Imam Hussein, but then when I look in the historical sources, those historical sources don't bear that out. One thing that we have to understand about the journey of Imam Hussein is not that Imam Hussein's journey was simply on a physical level. And not just that Imam Hussein was presenting a particular message that had a particular time and a particular context. But if we understand the message of Imam Hussein as something that goes beyond the physical, that goes beyond the historical, then we can understand this message as being something that is, has a spiritual reality, has a reality that goes beyond what we can see and what we can understand as human beings. And so the people that surrounded Imam Hussein, the historical reports that we have from the events of Karbala, come from various sources. One of those sources is from the Ahlul Bayt themselves. Another one of those sources is, are those who survived within the camp of Imam Hussein. So we have actually sources from the companions of the Imam, people who were injured, maybe they fell unconscious on that day, but then they survived, and so they endured. We also have reports from the enemy soldiers this was, in the end of the day, an army. And enemy soldiers have chroniclers. They will report what happened to the Khalifa. And so we have all of these different sources, and we put them all together to be able to understand the historical record of what happened on the day of Karbala. But when we look in the words of the Ahlul Bayt, what the Ahlul Bayt tell us is something that goes beyond the historical. When we see the ziyarat, the words of ziyarah from the Ahlul Bayt, they don't necessarily always tell us of what exactly happened at this moment or at that. What they prioritize and what they highlight is the spiritual reality of Imam Hussein. We say, As-salamu alayki ya safiya Allah wa abna safiya. I send my salutations upon you, O person who was distinguished and selected by Allah, and a person, the son of the person who was also distinguished by Allah, selected by Allah. You see that the Ahlul Bayt prioritized that spiritual reality of the events of Karbala. And so we see that according to the Ahadith of our various Imams, I recited some of these from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq yesterday, in which the Imam said, 
in which the Imam highlights the way that the natural world, the wild beasts, the heavens and the earth, and everything in between responded to the events of Karbala. If we were to see on that day, if we were to witness, if we were to be alive on Ashura in the year 61 after Hijra, we maybe would not see these wild animals coming and sacrificing themselves or shedding tears for Imam Hussein. Maybe even we would not be able to see the heavens crying tears of blood for Imam Hussein. Or if we were to uncover a rock, according to the ahadith, this is what the ahadith tell us, that the heavens and the earth cry for Imam Hussein. If we were on that day, we may not have witnessed that reality. But our blind eyes, the fact that we only are confined to the physical world, does not negate the reality that the Ahlul Bayt are talking about. It does not make it a subjective reality. The Ahlul Bayt are trying to inform us that objectively, if our eyes were open, our hearts were opened to those inner realities of Allah's creation, then we as well could witness it. And so just because we don't see it ourselves doesn't negate that reality. Sometimes we are able to see the moral universe of Allah and how it affects the physical universe. Sometimes we are able to see this. Allah opens our eyes such that we can witness it. And one of those uh, instances is that we see in our own society, in our own day and age, we see that the natural world is rejecting our actions, the environment. We think that we can overcome and do with the environment as we will. But then we see that time and time again, these climate crises affect us. What is the source of this climate crisis? Is it simply because of a material limitation in this world? Of a physical limitation in Allah's creation? No, the source of this crisis is a moral crisis. We as human beings think we can dominate the natural world. We think we can do with the natural world as we please. We think we are conquerors over the world that Allah has created. And so we can do whatever we want. We can create the cities as we please, as is ef efficient and convenient for us. We can live our lives in terms of that convenience. And that's it. We have dominated the world. And so sometimes we can fool ourselves in thinking that technology is going to save us. Material good is going to save us. But if we really think about it, it's the moral crisis amongst human beings that has caused this destruction. If we don't think about our natural world in terms of something that we can dominate, and if we think about it in terms of something we must live with, we must interact with, then, and only then, can we overcome this crisis. In fact, if we look in the Qur'an, Allah tells us that one of the means by which shaitan, Iblis himself, tells Allah, he promises to Allah, that I am going to misguide these human beings, this creation that you have created, and you have set above and beyond me. One of the ways that shaitan tells us he promises to Allah. He says that لَآمُرَنَّهُمْ فَلَيُغَيِّرَنَّ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ Shaitan promises to Allah that I will command them. He gives a number of different commands. And he will say that I will command these human beings. And they will do this. And they will do that. And then he says, I will command them and then they will change the creation of Allah. They will change this very creation that you have created for them. 
And so it is said that during the time in which this, had, this ayah was revealed to the Prophet, the polytheists, the mushrikun of the Prophet's time, they would cut the ears of their cattle. They would change that creation that Allah had created for them. And they would think that this will bring them prosperity. If I do this to my camel, if I do that to my cattle, if I change that creation, this is going to bring me prosperity and comfort in my life. Now think about it. The message of the Qur'an is not limited to the time of the mushrikun of the Prophet's time. The message of the Qur'an speaks to us as well. How have we changed the creation of Allah to benefit ourselves? And we have forgotten about the other part of that equation. We have forgotten about our responsibility towards Allah through His creation. If we want to think about one of those enduring qualities of the, of the sha'air of Allah, of the procession towards Karbala, we think about it in terms of how it corresponds to the natural world. We say that the natural world cries and laments for Aba Abdullah. And so this lamentation that we have corresponds to that creation that Allah has created for us, the physical world. Because we see that the moral universe that Allah has created has an utter effect, a direct effect towards this created world. The message of Rasulullah tells us that we cannot overcome and overpower the creation of Allah. We must live with it. And we must respect Allah's creation. And so, the message of Imam Hussein then corresponds to that creation. But on a higher level, we said that one of the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt tell us that even the angels of Allah, we think about the aspiration that we have as human beings, is to think not just in terms of this physical world, but to think about our relationship with Allah. And that relationship, Allah signifies that relationship in terms of how His angels deal with us, how His angels interact with us. That is the connection that we have as human beings with Allah. Allah commands His angels, and His angels see that command through. We have these principles. We have that we, we must correspond our actions to our human nature. We have to correspond our actions to the natural world and we must correspond our actions in terms of our ultimate goal, which is our relationship with Allah. And once we have that, then our actions can become enduring and universal. It is only with the grace of Allah that those rituals can last throughout time. Those are our principles. But then we have to, as human beings, translate those principles in terms of our context, in terms of our lives. And so, we have this teaching in the Qur'an itself. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah tells us that you have these principles. For example, the Hajj. You have this principle, Salat. You have all of these different requirements that Islam places upon us. But then we have to translate these into our lives. The principles of having makarim al-akhlaq, of having a beautiful relationship and a beautiful virtues that we have cultivated in our souls. These are principles. I must be a compassionate person towards my family towards my community members. I must be a caring and loving person. I must be a humble person, a person who cares about truth and justice. There are all of these principles. But these aren't just words that we express or that we say. We have to translate them into our lives. And so Allah says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ خُذِ الْعَفْوِ وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ Allah says to the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi 
Hold fast on to forgiveness. Forgive people when they wrong you. This is a principle. You have to be kind and gentle towards others. وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ This is an important principle. You have to command what is good. Commanding the good. أَمْرِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَالنَّهِيَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Ma'ruf in Arabic or orf in Arabic means good. Sometimes we translate it as commanding the good. But orf in Arabic doesn't just mean good. It means what is understood to be good. What your society deems to be good. So our society defines for us on one level, it's not the only thing that defines it, on one level, what we understand to be good is defined by the society that we live in. And so, for example, if I want to command my child to do good, I have to command them according to that, what that person understands themselves. For example, if I want to tell my child to, to do good, they have to, for example, I will tell them that you have to be kind towards your brother or you have to be kind toward your sister. I tell them in terms of things that they understand themselves. If I want to command good in this society, I have to say, for example, don't drive violently. Don't drive you know, in this angry manner. Right? You have to be kind towards the people that you are driving with, the people that you interact with, your coworkers, and so on and so forth. This is what our society defines on one level as being good. And so our understanding of those principles has to be translated into our society. That's on one level. And our approach towards those goods, towards those principles, are, must also be defined by our society. So if you're thinking about Amr bil Ma'roof, it's not just that, for example, there is a good, and I have to figure out whatever means I can towards reaching that good. So for example, I want to teach my child to do salat, to do namaz. I have to do it in a way which is also good. The means by which I reach that principle must also be good. And so in this society, hitting your child is seen as something that is bad. And so I can't use that as a means to get to that good. On the one hand, it's the principle that I'm trying to get is defined as being good. On the other hand, the means to that principle must also be good. So we see that Islam allows some flexibility in the way that we define those principles that it sets for us. And this is something that comes natural as well. When we think about Hajj, we don't think about going towards Hajj in the same way that people went towards Hajj a thousand years ago. It's defined by the society that we live in, by the time that we live in. And we see the same thing happening in the events of Ashura. There is a principle that we have. We must cry and lament Imam Hussein. This is a principle. Whether our society allows for it or not, once we have the principle, our principle isn't defined by good, by, rather by the customs and the society that we live in. Rather, when we want to translate that principle into our life, that's when we have to look at how our society acts and what our society seems, deems as being customary. Let me just give a very quick example. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We have this principle in Islamic societies and Islamic cultures, and we have this word, right? We call it in Farsi, we call it ta'aruf or ta'aruf. In Urdu, I believe you call it takalluf. And in Arabic, you have other words, mujamala and so on. The principle is you have to be kind and you have to be hospitable. You have to have a sense of compassion and kindness and you have to be hospitable towards those around you. If you want to invite someone into your house, you have to offer them food or you have to offer them to enter into the house before you do. 
That's how we understand it in our Muslim societies, whether you're from Iran, from Pakistan, from Iraq, or wherever other Muslim society you come from. You have this sense of hospitality that you define and you interpret in terms of this idea called takalluf, ta'aruf, mujamala, and so on. Now, we want to come and we want to translate this into English. What's the word that you use to translate takalluf into English? Do we have a word? It's very difficult, right? We have a principle, hospitality, generosity. We want to translate it into our language. We can't find a word. And so we have to maybe adopt a word from Arabic, adopt a word from Farsi. We have to figure out what does it mean for me to do ta'aruf in my society. Maybe it doesn't mean that I offer them to enter into my house first. Maybe it doesn't mean that I stand up for them when they enter into the room. Maybe it means something else. I have to figure out what does that principle, how I can translate that principle into my life. Because the ultimate goal is not to have these principles that we think about, not to have these principles that we talk about, but to live these principles to have to lead a life that is based upon these principles. And so for us to come and translate these principles into our life means that these principles must be flexible and must be applied into a lived reality. And this is one of those enduring, one of those things that makes the Aza of Aba Abdullah endure throughout time and, and space. Each and every society, each and every culture that has heard about the sacrifice of Imam Hussein, that has heard about the message of Imam Hussein, they take this principle of crying and lamenting and they apply it to their culture throughout time and space again. The visitation of Imam Hussein began, we said yesterday, began with Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, during the very time of the life of the Ahlul Bayt, just 40 days after the events of Ashura. But then it continues, and we see that the first shrine that was created for Aba Abdullah was by Mukhtar, only a few years after the events of Ashura. But then that shrine is created, and then it's destroyed. In fact, if you look throughout history, there were moments in time in which the very khulafa of the people of the Muslims destroyed that shrine. One of the first instances that we see is by Mansur, by these people who claimed themselves to be the Shia of the Banu Hashim. Comes and destroys the shrine of Abu Abdullah. It's rebuilt. Mutawakkil comes and he as well destroys the shrine of Aba Abdullah and then it's rebuilt again. Throughout time this process continues. The shrine is destroyed and then it's rebuilt. People are banned from visiting the, the grave of Imam Hussein. They are killed in that journey towards Imam Hussein and then they are and then that journey is opened once again. The latest moment in which the shrine of Aba Abdullah was destroyed was just 120 or so years ago when the city of Karbala was attacked and it was ransacked. But then we see today that that shrine is rebuilt and people are from every single part of the world, they are attracted towards Imam Hussein. What is it that gave this flexibility towards the ziyara of Imam Hussein? You see that this is as well one of the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. There is a hadith of our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Because there are ayat of the Qur'an, I wanted to pick up the 
my notes here. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It is reported that Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, when he had a visitor, one of his companions, by the name of Abu Harun al-Makfuf, the Imam turned towards his companion and he said to him, Anshidni, Ya Abu Harun. The Imam is telling Abu Harun to begin this process, begin mourning for Abu Abdullah. Abu Harun had come into the company of Imam Sadiq, seeing that the Imam is crying and he is shedding tears. And he asks the Imam, what is happening? Why are you shedding these tears? Why are you in this state? The Imam tells him that this is the day in which my forefather, my grandfather, Imam Hussein, was killed. And so I am mourning for my grandfather, Hussein. And so Imam Hussein tells him, Anshidni ya Abba Harun. Mourn and lament for me, O Abba Harun. Recite some lines of poetry for me. Recount that tale of Imam Hussein. And so Abba Harun begins. And it is said that the Imam cried so much, he shed so much tears that Abba Harun was taken aback. And then the Imam, at some point, he, his cries slow down. And then he says again, Anshidni ya Abba Harun. But O oh, Abba Harun, Anshidni and lament for me. Recite these lines of poetry for me, but not as you want or you think that I want and I am accustomed to. Anshidni kama tunshiduna berraqa. Recite for me those lines of poetry as you and your people recite in your particular city. Think about this tragedy in terms of when you have lost one of your own beloved family members. How would you recite? How would you recount that memory? How would you shed those tears? And so it is said that Abba Harun recited these lines of poetry. Umrur ala jadath al Hussein, faqul li a'dhumuhi al zakiya. Pass by the, the bones of Hussein and tell those bones and tell those remains, those pure remains. Ya a'dhuma la zilti min wadfa'i sakibatan rawiya. O remains of Hussein, O grave of Hussein, you continue to open my eyes. You continue to force my eyes to shed tears and for my eyes and my tears to flow. It is said that Imam Sadiq himself, from the time of Imam Sadiq, he began this process of translating the Aza of Imam Hussein in terms of whichever culture and whichever society that heard that Aza. And so the Imam would commend and he would recommend his followers to recite lines of poetry for the Imam and to shed tears in public for Imam Hussein and to remember Imam Hussein in a way that would move their soul. And so it is said that Imam Sadiq himself says, if a person were to recite a line of poetry and either he begins to cry or another 10 people begin to cry, then Allah will reward that person with Jannah itself. The Imam says no. Not just that, but if a person begins to recite lines of poetry for Abu Abdullah, and only five people are there to cry for Imam Hussein and he makes them cry, then Allah will give that person paradise. And he re even reduces it. He says, if only a single person were to cry for Abba Abdullah, or he, if he were to make another person cry, and a single drop of tear were to fall from that person's eyes, Allah himself will reward that person with paradise. And so we gather in these majalis remembering Imam Hussein, crying for that Imam, whether we feel self-conscious or not. This is one of our principles that we have. We translate and transform our lives in terms of this Aza of Imam Hussein. 
And we think about that journey that the Imam took. But of course, the journey of the caravan of Aba Abdullah did not end in the day of Ashura. That journey continued towards Kufa and it continued towards Sham until finally there was a point in which the caravan of the Banu Hashim comes back. The caravan of the Ahlul Bayt comes back to the city of Medina. It is said that when the caravan comes towards the city of Medina, the people had heard, the whispers had come towards the people of the city of Medina. Umm Salama had seen the Prophet of Allah the wife of the Prophet of Allah had seen the Prophet of Allah come to her in her dreams, telling her about the killing of Hussein, showing her that vial of blood, that sand of Karbala being dyed by the blood of Hussein, seeing Rasulullah himself lamenting and crying and mourning for Hussein. It is said that when Umm Salama sees Rasulullah, she sees him in a state in which she had never seen Rasulullah before. It is said that the clothes of Rasulullah in the dream of Umm Salama, she saw Rasulullah coming in clothes that had been gathered, that dust had been gathered upon them. It is said that Umm Salama saw Rasulullah mourning in such a way that she had never seen the Prophet before. This is how Umm Salama heard about the tragedy of Karbala. On the other hand, Umm al Banin had heard that her sons had been killed by the banks of the Euphrates. She had heard that Abbas had fallen by those banks and his arms had been cut. And it is said that Umm al Banin would create a grave a mock grave for her sons. And she would tell the people of Medina, don't call me Ummul Banin anymore <laughs> because I do not have any more sons to speak of. But it is said that finally when the caravan of the Ahlul Bayt came towards Medina, it is at that moment in which they heard those eyewitnesses from the camp of Imam Hussein, speaking and mourning for Imam Hussein themselves. And it is said that before this caravan of Imam Sajjad, of Lady Zainab, they entered into the city. It is said that Imam Zainul Abideen told one of his servants to go out and to prepare the city of Medina, for we have come close. It is said that the caravan of Aba Abdullah, they set up camp outside of the city of Medina. And, they, and Imam Sajjad sent his servant Bashir out into the city of Medina to prepare these people for what message they are going to bring. It is said that Imam Zainul Abideen told to the people of Medina, O oh, people of Medina, you have forsaken my father. Hear about the news of my father. It is said that Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, the brother of Imam Hussein, comes and asks Imam Zainul Abideen, What news do you have of Hussein? What are you going to come and tell me about Hussein? We can only imagine what Imam Sajjad would respond. He said, Oh, my uncle. <laughs> He said, Wa Hussein, <laughs> Wa Abata, oh my uncle, if only you were there to witness <laughs> what they did to my father. Wa Abata, oh my father, I can still see your body upon the floor. <laughs> it is said that Lady Zainab when she came upon the body of Imam Hussein, when the children of Imam Hussein came and looked for the body of their father, they could not recognize the body of Aba Abdullah. It had been damaged so much, the head had been severed from the body, any signs of the body of Imam Hussein had not been left. But it is at the same time said, that when Lady Zainab comes to the city of Medina, the people of Medina could not recognize the 
Lady Zainab herself, this lady that they had been surrounded with for her entire life, they could not recognize Lady Zainab. And so we might think that there, a tragedy had befallen the caravan of Imam Hussein on the day of Karbala. But what tragedy did Lady Zainab face throughout these different cities? What tragedy did Lady Zainab face in Kufa and Sham such that no one could recognize the face and the appearance of Lady Zainab anymore? It is said that the back of Lady Zainab, the back of Imam Sajjad had been broken, not because of the events of Karbala, but their backs had been broken in the city of Sham. And this is what Imam Sajjad recounts when he is asked what was the most difficult point in your journey. Imam Sajjad says, Asham, Asham, Asham. They dragged us through these, mass, these markets. They dragged us as prisoners and they would pelt us with whatever they had. <laughs> they would beat us with whatever they had. <laughs> Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Matama Hussain. And this one's very simple. All you have to repeat after me is Assalamu alaik ya Aba Abdullah ya Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alaik ya Aba Abdullah ya Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alaik ya Aba Abdullah ya Aba Abdullah Assalamu alaik ya Aba Abdullah ya Aba Abdullah Fatima la tima bidumu'i wal hanin id tara bil ara id tara bil ara Ibn Khair al Mursalin, Ibn Khair al Mursalin, Damian, Damian, Alian min hul anin, what, 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 Ya Aba Abdullah, Assalamu alaik Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Aba Abdullah, Assalamu alaik Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Qatil al Ida, Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Aba Abdullah, Assalamu alaik Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Aba. الرذيع الفجيح دمه إلى العلا باكيا شاكيا همه إلى السماء همه إلى السماء ذمني واسقني أبته من كما قدم للسماء يا شهيد كربلا يا شهيد كربلا ما تبيد يديك يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله يا منار الهدى يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله 
يا أبا عبد الله يا غريب يا سليب يا مقطع الكفوف يا جريح يا ذبيح كنت تعمة السيوف كنت تعمة السيوف بالأسى ما نسى قلبنا يوم الطفوف والحجر والأثر من يدي أبا الحتوف من يدي أبا الحتوف سيدي يا حسين يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله لا يا سريع الرضا يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا الرماح والجراح والمآسي قائمة والخيام والظلام والإياد الآثمة والأياد الآثمة والصغار بين نار في البرار هائمة قد أتت وجثت للعزاء فاطمة للعزاء فاطمة وتنوح عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله يا سليب الرضا يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليه محمد وآل محمد We have like eight minutes for Salat, so inshallah we'll take time to prepare and uh, we'll do Adhan shortly. <laughs>